this time, we are going to be in Ezekiel 1. So this morning we're going to be in Ezekiel 1 in the Old Testament. This is part 2 because it's a, it's a pretty intricate chapter. I didn't want to rush through it. Uh, what we did was we, if you're new to the Bible, this is going to be an eye-opener, right? If you say, you know, I, I consider myself a Christian. I lean in that direction. You know, I sort of go to church here and there, but I've never heard this stuff before. Well, sadly enough, a lot of churches are turning away from teaching the Bible and trying to be relevant and capture people and do all kinds of things to what they think will grow the church or make it successful, but it often doesn't work or becomes a very shallow institution. So the Bible, you know, all 66 books, they're powerful. They're written in three different languages. They've written arguably over a period of 2,000 years, different geographical locations. So you got all these Bible writers who didn't know each other and they're all saying the same thing when they have this encounter with God. So last Sunday, we triangulated the prophets, right? We looked at this uh, 6th century BC Babylonian period where they pretty much took over the known world at the time. Unfortunately for Israel, she got caught up in this. And um, you can find this in your history books. It's all solid history, right? History either happened or it didn't happen. Um, we know that, and you, it's so funny, I like to look at secular sources and they'll mention the prophets, right? Uh, Daniel was expatriated, Ezekiel, uh, and Jeremiah, though, stayed in Jerusalem and ministered. So we triangulated the prophets, but we also triangu triangulated the heavenly visions, right? We see Ezekiel's vision. He sees angels. He sees these, uh, what we arguably call the theophany or Christophany. I'll get to that. Uh, so Ezekiel sees this incredible angelic vision and heavenly vision. But we also see this in Isaiah's book, right? He sees the seraphim with the six wings, Isaiah 6, another very powerful scripture. But we also saw this in John in the book of Revelation, right? He goes up to the throne room of God. So you, you kind of can triangulate those three heavenly visions and make heads or tails of the heavenly scene. Of course, it's going to be a lot more magnificent when we get to be there. Um, and again, I just want to caution you, if you're not familiar with the scripture, this is one of those very deep and heavy portions of scripture. When we're done with Ezekiel, we're gonna go into the Gospel of Luke, which lightens things up a little bit, and you see things from a different perspective. And we're gonna look at today's message in three parts. So I'm gonna read it. It's a little, little tough, but I'm gonna to, to break it down for us. So Ezekiel 1, starting with verse 1. Now, the last time we covered up to verse 14, so I'm gonna read it for context, but then I'm gonna go into 15 through 21. So. Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, and I was a, as I was among the captives by the river Kibar, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. On the fifth day of the month, which was in the fifth year of King Jehoiachin's captivity, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, and the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kibar. And the hand of the Lord was upon him there. Then I looked, and behold, a whirlwind was coming out of the north, a great cloud with raging fire engulfing itself, and we described all of this and went into great detail, and brightness was all around it and radiating out of its midst like the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. And from within it came the likeness of four living creatures, right? We saw this in the book of Revelation, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Each one had four faces. Each one had four wings. Their legs were straight, and the soles of their feet were like the soles of calves' feet. They sparkled like the color of burnished bronze. They had the hands of a man under their wings, on their four sides, and each of their four faces and wings. Their wings touched one another. The creatures did not turn when they went, but each one went straight forward. As for the likeness of their faces, each had the face of a man. Each of the four had the face of a lion on the right side. Each of the four had the face of an ox on the left side, and each of the four had the face of an eagle. Thus were their faces. Their wings were stretched upward. Two wings of each one touched one another, and two covered their bodies. And each one went straight forward. They went wherever the Spirit wanted to go, and they did not turn when they went. As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, and like the appearance of torches. Fire was going back and forth among the living creatures. The fire was bright, 
and out of the fire went lightning, and the living creatures ran back and forth in appearance like a flash of lightning. So we covered, we discussed all this. Here's where we're going to get to for today's sermon, verse 15. Now, as I looked at the living creatures, behold, the wheel was on the earth beside each living creature with its four faces. The appearance of the wheels and their works was like the color of beryl, and all four had the same likeness. The appearance of their works was, as it were, a wheel in the middle of a wheel. A wheel in the middle of a wheel. We're going to get to that. When they went, they went toward any one of the four directions. They did not turn aside when they went. As for their rims, they were so high, they were awesome, and their rims were full of eyes all around the four of them. When the living creatures went, the wheels went beside them. And when the living creatures were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up. Wherever the Spirit wanted to go, they went, because there the Spirit went, there the Spirit went. And the wheels were lifted together with them, for the Spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. When those went, these went. When those stood, these stood. When those were lifted up from the earth, the wheels were lifted up together with them, for the Spirit of the living creatures was in the wheels. And now you know why a lot of churches don't teach this stuff, right? Okay, so one out of three, it does take a lot of prayer. It takes a lot of searching out of the scriptures, pulling things together. What is going on here? So one out of three is the wheels. Now, I would say that the wheels are probably one of the most fascinating things that Christians and non-Christians alike focus on, right? When you think of Ezekiel, a lot of people think the wheels, the wheels, so what's going on here? Well, if we could put up the image. So this is sort of a, it's an artist's rendition, and of course it's not perfect, but here's Ezekiel. He sees the cherubim, or the cherubim, right? I am denotes plurality. He sees the wheels. Um, maybe it doesn't show the best picture of the wheels within the wheel, or this might be the perpendicular wheel. Then you see the firmament and then the appearance of the man above. So this is what Ezekiel saw, and you wonder why he's bowing down. He's probably on sensory overload right there. So what God is trying to do with Ezekiel is convey a message to him. He's trying to commission him because there's things that he wants Ezekiel to do. And remember, context is so, so important when you study the Bible. What just happened? The Babylonians came city to city, breaking down walls, burning them with fire, chariots and horses and, and wood and steel and, or different metals. And, and their swords, and they just, nobody could stop the Babylonians, right? I mean, even when I was in grade school, when I didn't know anything about God, we learned about Babylon. Everybody understands a little bit about Babylon here. So this is history. What God is trying to show them, or show Ezekiel, and it, it is quite possible that God is saying, well, you think Babylon has some awesome chariots? Look what's under me. And, and again, I'm paraphrasing. I don't know that to be the case. But God is trying to say, I think, more importantly is, regardless, focus on me. He's trying to encourage uh, the children of Israel. They were humiliated, they were demoralized, as were many other ethnic groups under the Babylonians. And these were God's people, and they were like all kind of wondering, well, how did this happen? And as we get further into Ezekiel, we're going to see how it happened, right? And why uh, their, their wicked decisions put them in this place. Um, but you can see God almost saying here through this, I haven't intervened yet. You have to trust me. And folks, you know, God is God. He, he loves his people back then. He loves his people today. God is timeless. So I would encourage you too. what are you going through in your life? And I would just say that give God a chance to intervene in your life as well. He didn't love uh, Ezekiel or Isaiah any more than he loves you and me. So this is a timeless truth. And it's very important that we express that. God spoke through Jeremiah. He said that Babylon only had 70 years to get it right. This was an oppressive force. He gave them time to repent, and some of them did, and some of them didn't. And then they were destroyed by the Medo-Persians. We know this from history, right? Um, now, we see the movement of the wheels are much more complex than wagons and chariots of those days. If you study ancient warfare, there were only some things that were limited to these invading armies. They had siege warfare, right? The catapults and the different things they did to try to get through a, a city wall. But they didn't have bombers, they didn't have F-35s, you know. They didn't have any of that stuff. 
So when you understand the old ways that, you know, if God was to show a vision today, maybe it would be a different vision. Maybe he would say, listen, don't worry, I'm more powerful than, you know, those planes and those bombs. I can do whatever. I, you know, I don't know. But you also see that he's meeting Ezekiel where Ezekiel is at, right? Ezekiel is just a man. He's just like you and me. He's frail. He has feelings. He has emotions. And, you know, God is, is, this is not a scary vision. These are the good guys. He's trying to encourage Ezekiel in this time. You know, and you see that when God commissions somebody to send them out to something that might be a difficult task, he has to encourage them for, he has to build them up. You know, we talk about that in Christianity. How can you pour over the overflow of your life and build up somebody else if your life isn't being filled by the things of God? So what we teach, right, when we do discipleship is that you have to be filled first. It's kind of hard for you to help others when you haven't been strengthened and filled by God first. So these are some really neat principles. And remember, this book was written 2,550 uh, years ago, but it still applies today. So let's look at, again, I, <laughs> on any given Sunday, you know, we, we reach an audience online, on the computer. We reach people who are agnostic, atheist, and who knows, I might have some people in here sitting in the seats that are like that. So let me encourage you, because I want to reach you as well. Let's look at some inventions of the 19th and 20th centuries that were inspired by Ezekiel's, especially the wheel within a wheel, right? They didn't have to turn. The old chariots, they had the straps, and they would try to turn the horses, and the wagons would turn, but there would be friction. I, I used to work on cars and stuff, right? Um, you know, front end alignments, you got to have the, the camber and the toe and all that stuff. Um, the tires have to have as little friction as possible when it makes turns, when it goes straight, because otherwise you wear out the tire quicker. So in those old days, they didn't have, do I have some mechanics here? I know I got some engineers in here. You can correct me if I was a little off on that one. Uh, but God's stuff, just it just goes where it wants to go. It moves as fast as lightning. It's outside of our laws of physics. And it must have wowed Ezekiel, right? I mean, when you really have an experience with God, you're like, Lord, I'll do anything. That's a true experience with God. So let's look at some of these inventions. Little known, um, 1902, there was a pastor who built what was called the Ezekiel Airship from this. Now, this was the time where, you know, we were learning to fly and people were th getting things into the air. And you see some of these old videos in black and white and they, and they crash and it looks ridiculous, right? <laughs> these wing things. And eventually we develop, you know, the airfoil and Bernoulli, Bernoulli's principle and you get lift from the wind passing over the airfoil. Fun stuff. Um, some of you, I'm boring with this, <laughs> but I won't take too much time on it. So he, he takes his savings and he builds this thing, and there's actually museums that have a, a, a likeness of this, this Ezekiel airship. You can look it up, you know, in your search engine. Um, unfortunately for the pastor, he took it out one time, and there was a storm, and it busted the thing up to pieces, but he, he still had the pieces, right? Uh, we know that uh, to a wheel within a wheel. So there's this thing called a race. I don't mean stuff that the media talks about incessantly. Um, when it comes to auto me mechanics, it's, it's a race, right? It's, a, uh, it's really a wheel within a wheel. There are ball bearings, and this, th what we can do with ball bearings is incredible today, right? You see it on almost everything, aeronautics, auto mechanics, any type of machine, right, fans and such. So you have these, these chrome uh, perfect balls that go in, in a series and they're uh, kept in a track by these metal objects and they, they call that a race. And what happens is that invention is really a wheel within a wheel. So this wheel within a wheel concept blew everybody's mind and people couldn't wait to have invent something new. You also have your homokinetic joints or what we would know in auto mechanics is the constant velocity joint. And it's technically a wheel within a wheel. You know, you have, especially for front-wheel drive cars, so you have your, your drive shaft, right? And then you have your wheel. The problem with the wheel is it goes up and down with the road. So if it was a solid piece, it could snap or bust the wheel up. So the constant velocity joint is, it has ball bearings in it, and it has a, a, an arm, it has a sleeve, and it, you know, it does this as, as it goes up and down with the road. So you have your wheel within a wheel. <laughs> Where did the original design come from? It came from Ezekiel. We'll move on to one more. Uh, the gyroscope. The gyroscope. 
is more fascinating because, well, these wheel wi within the wheels had uh, they worked on the X, Y, and Z axis, axis, axes, multiple is axes. Um, so the gyroscope actually takes the concept and goes a step further than the what what's, has already been invented, not a step further than what God made, and it gets closer to what God has made. So you have this situation where it measures. Um, and it maintains orientation and angular velocity on the X, Y, and Z axes, gyroscope. So it can either measure it or it can, it, it can, it's been used in, in, in our aeronautics to keep the plane level in orientation, right? We talk about latitude, longitude, and altitude. We talk about width, height, and depth, right? The three dimensions. And then you get into the W axis, which you get into um, string theory, wormholes, and all these other dimensions, but we're not going to go there today. <laughs> um, I did talk about a, an inventor in the, I believe it was the 1900s. He was a naval officer. Uh, his name was, I believe it was Maury. He read Psalm 8 that talked about the paths of the seas. So he thought, well, it's in God's word. It must be true. He changed the shipping industry because of God's word. Isn't that amazing? So if you try to steal somebody's patent today, they will sue you and take everything you have. God just puts it out there, and people have made inventions based on his, you know, his descriptors. It's pretty fascinating. So the paths of the sea, cartography, shipping, it, it increased or decreased shipping times because, you know, you can get the ships to go into the sea lanes. So if those of you who are into that, you, you know that stuff. Okay, enough with the science stuff. <laughs> Verse 18, <laughs> but it's fun, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's who, who knew that you know, in, unless you read the Bible and you're like, well, what came, I invented this. Well, you might have gone to the patent office, but God had already said it centuries, if not millennia, before you invented it, and everybody's been talking about it since. So verse 18, the, the, there's these rims on the wheels that are full of eyes. Now, some of these things are, and what we try to do is, because I'm a, I'm a mechanical type of person, I, I like science and the sciences, and I, I get my brain into a rut where I try to explain everything. And that can be problematic when you're reading the scripture because God doesn't work with metals and physics and stuff. God is God. He made those things so that there's some order in our universe, but he's not bound by those you know, physical properties. So then, then I get to something like this and I'm like, I hit a brick wall. But I wonder with the rims full of eyes, and we saw this in Revelation 4, 8 with the living creatures. Listen, if you're new to the church and you kind of like the church, it's not like this every Sunday. This is just one of those overly technical portions of Scripture, I promise you. So, okay. So, Revelation 4, 8, the living creatures were full of eyes. Now, is it possible that God was trying to uh, convey an indelible impression of his omniscience, right? All-knowing. And you see the eyes everywhere. Um, do the wheels and the directions represent God's quality of his omnipresence? He can be everywhere, anywhere. He's God. This is his creation. Uh, so you see these, he, he's immutable, which means God doesn't change because he's perfect. He doesn't have to change, right? We covered omniscience. We covered omnipresence. Could the cherubs or the angels and the spirits be part of his omnipotence, all-powerful? So even with these angelic beings, the spirit, what, is directing them where they go? The angels just don't do whatever they want, fly around the universe because they feel like it. They're servants of the living God. So a lot of really neat stuff here, and God is conveying it in a way that Ezekiel can at least understand and interpret it. So let's explore some of what people have attributed the vision to over the years, plausible and implausible. So, <clears throat> all right. We read this, and, and again, I, I'm guilty of it, being science-minded, and, and I my mind goes all over the place. Some people say, well, could this be a prophecy of jet propulsion, thrust? Even if you look at the, the artist rendition, it looks like sort of some type of wild machine that can take you anywhere you want to go. Um, I would just say this. When we read it's about some of these battles that were written thousands of years ago, and the Bible writer describes equipment of today, modern technology that they had no idea of back then, plausible because, you know, I, I believe one of the uh, words was uh, translated leapers in, in battle. They didn't understand what a leaper was. Was it a tank? Was it, it horses don't leap in battle? Uh, so what was it? And people have tried to put things together of, of these battle scenes. Okay, that's plausible. 
However, I would never connect a machine with God. God doesn't need, you know, some people read this and they say, well, I can see thrust here. I can see the legs dangling as the landing gear. This must be a jet. Just, you have to be careful because um, you can't associate God with something that he created because he's above that. So I would put that aside. Others have speculated that, I'm just going to say it, that they see flying saucers in this, right? They say, wow, that seems sort of like a UFO. Let's just digress for a moment. Have you noticed on television lately that there's more sightings? And three years ago, if I said this, they'd say, this guy's a kook. I'm never coming back to this church. However, we're seeing footage from F-18s, F-35s. These are pilots, U.S. pilots. And they're taking footage of these objects in our airspace. You know what's interesting? They're invading our airspace. You ever try to see them shoot, shoot them down? The answer is no. You know why? Because they know those things are outside of our... They can t turn on a dime. They can turn on a 45. Our military is smart enough to know, don't poke the bee's nest. Whatever they are, we don't know what they are. Maybe we should communicate with them. That's their idea. We should uh, film it. Again, this is on the mainstream media. The military now has passed laws that they are going to start to reveal this information to the public. And if you notice, it's happening more often. So they can't contain it anymore. So the question is, is that what we're seeing? Plausible and implausible. Let's look at it. These are the good guys. So if there's something up there doing something wacky, it isn't these guys. These are the good guys. However, let's make a parallel here. If they're cherubim, and if Satan, which we're going to get to in Ezekiel 28, is a fallen cherub, and he took a third with him, do they have similar powers? Yes. Do they have the extent of the powers? No. Why not? Because God is heading that. God will only contact us for good. But unfortunately, in the realm we are, exist in, because of sin entering the world, and we see this in Genesis 6, it happened years ago as well, the ancients, how did they build those things, right? For those that don't want to wait on God, they choose to contact something outside of our domain because they're looking for a little help. Well, let me just say this, that is extremely dangerous. Extremely dangerous. If you look at um, alien encounters, so they're not called UFOs anymore. The media ha or the military has reclassified them. I guess flying saucers is, you know, passe, and they look now you see triangles flying around, and they don't know what these things are. So they're calling them UAPs or unidentified aerial phenomena, and you're going to see more of this in the news. If you take alien encounters, now, how do I say this? <laughs> you, you, you understand my pain, Dave, right? There are some people who say, I've been abducted by an alien and this source mental illness or something involved there, but that's a small percent. What about the engineers? What about the military people? What about the people who say they've had encounters? Highly educated people, they live a balanced life, they're head of very high, you know, there's one military guy who was on Tucker Carlson, um, that he was saying this for a long time. They were all saying he was crazy. Now they're saying, yeah, we're sorry. Um, you weren't crazy. You were right all along. And he forced the issue of a lot of, I forgot the guy's name. He's a, a military uh, personnel. The, if you look at, if you have ever studied contacts, right, with these creatures or these phenomena, you'll always find that it's 100% negative. There's never a positive contact. Okay, if they've ever gone to some. If you take that and you overlay that with um, uh, strange phenomena as far as paranormal activity, you will see the same thing. So if you take a study, and there's been studies done, of those testimonies, hundreds of them, contact with an alien, the, the ones that supposedly lived, and you take that and you take the, um, the ones of uh, paranormal activity, they're demonic presences, and you put them together, they're the same thing. We are getting close to the time where the Lord's going to return. It's just all throughout the scripture. And the Bible tells us that some wacky things are going to happen before that happens. So here's my advice to you. If you don't know the Lord, don't contact these things. <laughs> don't try to contact dead relatives, because the demonic realm will play with us. 
right? They put out the litmus test. You don't want God, you want it now. Well, somebody will give you that answer, but it isn't going to be the right answer. Don't do it. So pretty, pretty uh, impressive stuff, pretty, pretty wild stuff. Um, and I would just say that, you know, you'll, you'll just, you'll regret it if you try to do these things. So they, they kind of go together. Then here's the question. Why would God, so again, put this aside. These are the good guys, right? Why would God allow it? Well, we talked about this last Sunday. Our culture likes to play with fire. They do. And in my past, before I was saved, I hung out with a crowd for a short amount of time that was into seances, Ouija boards, and stuff. And I'm going to tell you something. I didn't get sucked in. The Lord had his hand on me. It, this is why I serve him every day until my last breath, because he's delivered me from so many bad things. But I can tell you something. I saw some things that were not normal. They were not human. They were not inside of our laws of physics. And God pulled me out of that. I eventually got saved and, and repented and gave my life to Jesus Christ. But I'm going to tell you, there is a whole other, you can call it another dimension, another world. Right now, as, as we, if you go out into the city, you go out into you know, the town of Jamesburg on a, on a beautiful day and people are walking back and forth, what you don't see is behind the curtain, there are angels and there are demons. You just can't see them. But we see glimpses of this in the scripture. So if you want to <laughs> do something really wild and exciting, get to know Jesus Christ. You want to contact someone outside of this dimension, get to know your creator. Get to know the Lord. You'll never regret it. Because the other crew will bait you, they'll pull you in, and you won't be able to get out. So I'm just leaving it at that. Is it any wonder when Jesus came to the earth, and the earth was around for many thousands of years, that, or humanity, that Jesus did a lot of casting out demons? Because they're in this realm. And people seek after things, and they find the wrong answer. Talk about looking for love in all the wrong places. Seek out God, okay? All right. That's pretty, <laughs> I'm sweating up here, right? You know, God loves you, but he gave you free will. You can choose to accept him or you can choose to reject him. Verse 22, continuing on. The likeness of the firmament above the heads of the living creatures was like the color of an awesome crystal stretched out over their heads. And under the firmament, their wings spread out straight one toward another, each one had two which covered one side, and each one had two which covered the other side of the body. When they went, I heard the noises of their wings, like the noise of many waters, like the voice of the Almighty, a tumult, like the noise of an army. And when they stood still, they let down their wings. A voice came from above the firmament that was over their heads. Whenever they stood, they let down their wings. So two out of three is the firmament. Let me just go back one more second. There was a thought in my head, it went out. It happens when you hit 53, but it came back in. You know, Hollywood, don't believe what you see in Hollywood. Hollywood is all fake, right? There are people for a living that are paid to pretend they're somebody else, to deceive you. And they're, they're paid to do it so well that you love the movie. You know what I'm saying? Um, that aside is their fascination with alien encounters. True alien encounters are always negative. They paint almost all of them as positive. This isn't like when I was a kid. Remember E.T. phone home? That cute little, uh, they put a, a hoodie on him. He was riding a bicycle and Elliot. I remember that movie. It was years ago I saw that. That is not what, what is actual reality. Just so you know, the cuddly little alien that you keep in your house and hope nobody finds out. He's like a pet. That is not what's going on. Okay, okay, continuing on. So the firmament. Firmament means, in translation, is, is the sky or the space. It can also mean a chasm or a gap. Remember in Revelation, the sea of glass prior to the throne. There was this, before you got to God's throne, right? John sees this, this picture of God. There was this beautiful uh, sea of glass like crystal. It was very hard to, for him to explain. It was colors and all kinds of things happening. So you see something very similar here, this firmament or this chasm. My understanding is that from when I look at this is God loves his creation, but make no mistake, God is above his creation. You know, sometimes people in our culture, this, it, we have a very strange culture that people can make themselves their own God. 
especially with social media. It's a dopamine release, right? It, it makes you feel good when you, know, you can say something really edgy or witty or take a picture and a thousand people love your picture. It, it kind of can build some narcissism into us. And our culture is in trouble. Even the stats on relationships from singles um, are not good in our culture. So the point I'm trying to make is that God only deserves glory. God only gets worship. My pastor taught my wife and I early on in our um, Christian walk. He was a man of few words, oftentimes. I would want more from him. And he'd sit with us and he'd say, never try to take God's glory. And you're like, I'm like, what? I'm a new believer. I have no idea what he's talking about. <laughs> but I do now. <laughs> so, you know, never try to take God's glory. Always realize that we're his, we're his children, right? We're his creation. He loves us. He died for our sins. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe on him would not perish but have eternal life. But we're not God's. And we'll never be him. And that's what got uh, Lucifer in trouble, right? Verse 24, Ezekiel hears the wings <coughs> of the angels. Uh, he hears sounds like many waters, the voice of the Almighty, and, and a marching army. Ezekiel has, he starts to see these things, these heavenly things. And I, I would say it's sort of like sensory overload. There's so much information, it's so powerful. It's a, it's a good thing, but it's also something that was taxing his human body. You notice that Ezekiel bows before the Lord. Isaiah, right, 6, he bows before the Lord. John in Revelation bows, right? Because as a human being, when you are experienced the glory of God, you have no choice but to, but to submit to him and to say, Lord, what do you want me to do? All the things we worry about, all the things that plague us, all the things that we, are, we obsess about, when you have an experience with God, at least temporarily, it goes away because you see what the real priority is. Amen? So it's pretty neat stuff. Um, verse 26, last few verses. And above the firmament over their heads was the likeness of a throne. So we're going up. As Ezekiel sees the vision, he's, okay, I'm it, paraphrasing here. Ezekiel, he looks at the foundation. He's describing it. He's mental notes, he's writing, whatever he's doing, um, and then we move from the wheels and the cherub, the cherubim, to the, to the firmament, and now he sees the throne, and one with the likeness of a man sitting on the throne. So let me read that again. Above the firmament, over their heads, was the likeness of a throne, in appearance like a sapphire stone. On the likeness of the throne was the likeness with the appearance of a man high above it. Also from the appearance of his waist and upward, I saw, as it were, the color of amber with a, the appearance of fire all around within it. And from the appearance of his waist and downward, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire with brightness all around. You start to see this in Revelation, the picture of Jesus Christ after he's ascended into heaven, his form changes. Verse 28, like the appearance of a rainbow on, on a cloudy in a cloud on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the brightness all around it. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. So when I saw it, I fell on my face. I heard, and I heard a, a voice of one speaking. So three out of three is the appearance of a man. Now, I'll, I'll just explain these words, theophany, Christophany. In, in the Old Testament, um, sometimes there would be an appearance. Again, God meets us where we're at. So whether it was Abraham or, or Moses, you know, God would have some sort of vague appearance because we really can't see his full glory in this sinful state. When we die, if we're in Christ and we go to heaven, um, we'll see him for all he is because we'll shed that sinful flesh that we carry with us through this world. That's why Christians do stupid things and I hurt people's feelings and I don't mean to because we still carry that sin element with us. So when God appears to sinful flesh, and, and Moses sinned, and Abraham sinned, and we all sin, um, there was this, you would call it a theophany, or, or an appearing of God. It's also called an anthropomorphism, which is a big word for, for the, the, the person who was seeing would, would see it in a way they could interpret it, so God would present himself in a way that they could interpret his form. It, it's, it's heavy. I'm doing the best I can here. Um, a Christophany 
is an appearance of Christ, right? There's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament before he actually took the form of a man in the first century. So people think, oh, Jesus came as a babe in a manger. Well, he was born. Be careful with that one. He's always existed. God so loved the world that he, he sent his only son. Where did he send him? He sent him to the earth in the form of a man to die for our sins, right? So that must have meant that he existed beforehand. So don't get hung up on that. Jesus wasn't a created being. He's eternal as God the Father is. So what are we seeing here in this, in this picture? We're seeing something that Ezekiel can relate to. God is meeting him where he's at. This is, this is our hero. This is God. No doubt, if I was Ezekiel, I would be obsessing over the Babylonians. I would be like, oh my goodness, they forced me into a foreign land. I can't go back and worship at the temple. This would be me, right? I'm not saying he said this. Oh my goodness, I wonder if I'll ever go back to see my relatives in Jerusalem again, right? I try to bring the Bible up to speed to what we would understand as a culture. Oh, this is terrible. Am I going to die in Babylon? And then God appears to him. And then all of a sudden, Ezekiel bows down and he goes, what can I do for you? So, you know what Ezekiel knew? That even in Babylon, God was there. And folks, no matter where you go, you can go on a desert island. You could get lost in the woods. God is there. So I just want to encourage you with that. You know, listen, I'm a homebody. I don't travel. I only, uh, I never went, I don't think I ever traveled out of the country unless I was in my mother's womb. Um, I only visited a few states. And I love home. But I also know that wherever I go, God is also there. So I'm just trying to encourage you with that. For those of you that are seeking, you know, I, I, this whole God thing is new to me. He's everywhere. That's the beautiful thing about God. All right. So that's what God is, sh is showing him. God is, is spirit, but he also appears to Ezekiel in a form that Ezekiel can understand. Um, and and you, gotta, you have to understand, and th there's just a lot to this is that some people, I guess, you know, you see Renaissance paintings and what angels look like. They look like little chubby children, you know, with curly hair. They're like miniatures. Um, they picture God in Renaissance paintings as an old man with a long beard. Um, that God is spirit. So don't, don't get your, I, I'm not asking you to go through your house and throw away the paintings that are not biblically accurate. But <laughs> and if I go to your house, I, I promise I won't criticize your painting. Uh, but the point is, we have to get our understanding of who God is from the Scripture. Amen? Because otherwise we get confused. The whole thing about even Jesus taking the form of a man, does Jesus look like that with his skin tone and, and his bone structure? In heaven, does he look like that? No, he doesn't. He's in his glorified form. Right? So the only time that we, we saw Jesus saying, oh, that's Jesus. I recognize him. This curly black hair and his beautiful tan, you know what I'm saying? Um, but that was only for the time that he spent on this earth. Now he's, you know, when John in Revelation sees the resurrected Jesus, now John ate bread with Jesus when he was on the earth. He hugged them. He slept. Uh, they, no doubt they, they slept, uh, the disciples, you know, when they were ministering and they, they, they put up their tents. Uh, you know, he hugged Jesus. He kissed Jesus, right? And when John now sees in, in Revelation, Jesus, in his resurrected form or his ascended form, he's blown away. He, he sort of recognizes the Savior, but he looks very different. So you're with me with that, okay? That's where the cults come in. What the cults do is they, they don't explain things to you. They just take the misunderstandings and they, they drive a wedge through it and they confuse people. But it's, it's really pretty neat stuff. We have to talk about what is Jesus like? What does he look like? That's really not important. It's really who he is but really it depends on what, what dispensation he came in. Amen? I want to share this with you. I hope that whatever you came into this church with today, maybe you got a project at work. Maybe you got a family situation that's driving you nuts. Maybe you have physical health. You know, the whole time I was preaching, I didn't think about the bur my burning face, right? <laughs> like when you start to get introduced to the things of God, it changes the channel, amen? And that's really what it needs to do. So whether you're confused right now, you're suffering, you're trying to find the answers, you know what? God is here. God is here. And when you go home and you have that quiet time, he, he, wants, to, he wants you to pray to him. He wants you to, he, he wants, if you don't know him, he wants you to engage him. But he also gave you free will, and that's your choice. 
Now let's look at the rainbow here. We see the rainbow in Revelation. We see the rainbow in Ezekiel. Um, what is a rainbow? Well, it's light that's reflected and reflect, refracted off of water droplets, usually after some sort of heavy storm. You know, it's in the air, and each water droplet, and you can see the refraction, and it takes the form of the, you know, the colors that come out of the refraction, and it's pretty neat. We, we covered this when we were in Revelation, how God sometimes expresses his glory and his beauty in colors, in light, right? It's an amazing thing. Light is actually an incredible property when you study light in physics. It has uh, particulate properties. It has uh, electromagnetic uh, spectrum property, properties. Light is, is, and then you, the black holes and the, you know, the bending of it's the refraction and all that. It's pretty wild stuff. But so let's go with the, the scripture. You know, no, Noah sees the rainbow after the storm, right? Most people are familiar with Noah. John in Revelation saw the rainbow before the storm. Ezekiel sees the rainbow through the storm. Amen? But one thing that is, you know, it's almost like God saying, here's my signature. Whether it's you're picking up the pieces afterwards, you're going to go through something difficult, or you're in the middle of it, I'm here. I'm here. And he's also here for you. Keep that in mind. So, Again, don't stress out about everything that's going on in the world. Um, you know, God, he's, Jesus Christ is your personal Savior. Uh, he can hear the prayers of 8 billion people on the planet, but he, he can also minister to you personally. We also see the Trinity here, right? God the Son, God the Father, God the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, the angels and the cherubs are guided by the Holy Spirit. The, the, the cherubs don't go in any direction unless the Spirit directs them. Pretty neat. So you see God the Holy Spirit. Uh, we also see God the Son in the form of the Christophany that we talked about. We also hear the voice from above in verse 25, which is probably that of God the Father. Now, if you remember Matthew chapter 3, when Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, you had the Son, you had the Spirit that descended like a dove, you also had the voice of the Father. Pretty neat, huh? So you see the word Trinity doesn't exist in the Bible. But all it is, is it's a, it's a label explaining the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. A lot of stuff in here. A lot of stuff. Last verse, and I'll leave you with this. He says, with well, the last part of it, he says, When I saw it, I fell on my face, and I heard a voice of one speaking. Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, you know, um, any of these people who have had a, even Joshua, right, in the Old Testament, the Christophany, the commander of the Lord's army, I have now come. Joshua doesn't recognize him at first. It's, it's kind of, he's an impressive figure. Joshua was tasked to lead the children of Israel. And I love that. Joshua goes, are you for us or are you against us? Not knowing it's, it's Christ pre-incarnate, right? And he doesn't even answer his question. He doesn't say, I'm for or against you. He goes, no. But as commander of the Lord's army, I have now come. You know, it's funny, even good people, even Christians, even, it's like we, we say to God, I, well, I want this or I want that. Can you, can you do this or you can do that? And sometimes God's like, not answering your question. Sometimes people think when we go to prayer that um, we have to get a bunch of stuff from God. It's, you know, it's like playing the lottery. It's our, it's our wish list. Lord, I need this, this, and this. But as we mature and we go to the Lord in prayer, we say to the Lord, what do you want me to do with my life? What do you want me to do with my life? And I've often said this from the pulpit. I've prayed for a lot of things. In about 25 years, I've been a Christian, maybe a little longer. And a lot of them haven't been answered. But I was able to look back with many of them, not with all of them, and figure out, wow, it's a good thing God didn't give me that. Do you ever think about that? Right? When we really have a close relationship with the Lord, we accept what he says. You know, sometimes we cry our eyes out. We, we pour our heart out to God. But we have to trust him with what he, how he responds to us. Some of the tribulations and trials I went through um, honed me for having a better character to do this. It, I wasn't enjoyable. Who likes to change? I don't see any hands going up. You have to change. Like, who's like willing to go, yeah, yeah, I want to change. 
oh, what is that, in, wait, hold on, what, what am I signing here? What does that entail, right? But God knows what's best for us. And through trials, it builds our character and it builds our patience. And we see that in the scripture. So I will tell you this, that when I went up to receive Jesus all those years ago, um, I think I was a pretty sturdy guy and my knees were knocking. I was nervous, but I, w- I was having an experience with God. I wanted to know him. It was my time. Do you want true love? Do you want a genuine relationship? Well, this is where you find it. And even going back to the people seeking, you know, um, going to tarot card readers and psychics, and <clears throat> they're just they're people are looking for answers. And I'm not, I'm not criticizing anybody, but I'm just saying that's dangerous because you're going to get the one person who really knows how to get, get the answers from the underworld, and they're going to they're gonna twist your mind. I know a lot of people who have come back with really bad advice that could have destroyed them. They're not your friends. If you're seeking, if you're interested, if you're curious, turn to the living God. You can do that today. Amen? So, the sermon is titled, God's Vision to Ezekiel. What about your experience with God? Do you want one? Are you willing to let him into your life? And I'm not talking about a religion, because I was in a religion since I was a little boy, but I had no relationship with God. I'm talking about an honest-to-goodness relationship with your Creator. Yeah, and you might say, that's, that's crazy. Why would the Creator of everything want a relationship with me? Why did He make you personal? Why did He give you the ability to feel love and exchange in a relationship? He wants no less for Himself and you. So, I can't promise that your life will be perfect. Actually, I'd be lying if I told you your life would be perfect after coming to your Savior. But I can tell you that it will be fulfilling and you will know that you know that you know, like Ezekiel, that you had an experience with God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, some heavy stuff in your words sometimes. You know, it's just going through the descriptors, and um, it it's, can be overwhelming, especially for someone who's heard this or read it for the first time. But Lord, you know who it's going to reach. You know who it's going to get them interested and Lord, even through all the inventions and the scientific part of it, Lord, you are, you can minister to us through science. You can minister to us through personal feelings, caring for us, loving us, and even sacrificing for us. So I would just ask, um, while everybody's here in this room, you know, maybe you visited for the first time. Maybe you're, you're seeking the things of God. While the worship team does worship, if you would love to get to know God on a deeper level, on a relationship, I would ask while the worship team plays that you would come up to the front and I'll just lead you in a prayer. Honestly, we don't want anything from you. You don't have to sign anything. And honestly, you could find the church closer to your house and that would be fine. God is everywhere. He's in every church that does right in teaching the word. So you would just come up to the front now, maybe somebody who cares about you or you're somebody you're with will come up with you. Let me lead you in that prayer Uh, like we do on many Sundays, and just start that wonderful walk between you and the Lord. You come. anyone else before I lead these two people in, t- in a prayer to receive Christ? You know, when we, when we do ministry, there's a lot of things we can control, can, 
this is awesome because we're always surprised on a Sunday. Who's going to come up? Maybe nobody, maybe a few people. So this is your appointed time. God knew that you were going to be here today. He knew that he was going to reach you through Ezekiel's vision. This is not a coincidence. It's, I, I'm no great orator. It, this is God's word. So what I'm going to do now is lead you in a prayer. And basically, I'm just going to say something, and you're going to repeat it. But it means something to you because you're up here. God hears it. The Bible says that when one sinner repents, the angels rejoice. A lot of, and it's a lot of information. So let's just, let's just lead you into that prayer. We'll give you some free materials, and uh, you can start your walk with the Lord. Amen? Okay. All right. So let's uh, so just repeat after me. Dear Jesus, I know that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. I know that you died for me personally on that cross so that my sins could be atoned for. Lord, I desire to walk with you. And no matter what somebody says about my past, I, you know about my present and my future. You've prepared a beautiful place for me in heaven. And you desire that I have an abundant life in this world. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Was Susan and this is Jason. We just turn you around so everybody could see Jason and Susan. Amen. This is your church family, and they're. <laughs> That's pretty cool. God is good. Um, we just never know who He's going to reach. I remember when my wife, um, we were dating at the time, and we were going to Calvary Old Bridge, and we were going and going and going, and they did an altar call once, and she looked at me, and I looked at her, and she's like, I'm like, <laughs> and I had a lot of anxiety, because that church was a lot bigger than this one. You guys were toward the front. I had to walk a long way to come to the front to do an altar call, and my knees were shaking. So, you know, it's such a cool thing when you have an experience with God. It just, it can, it can involve your emotions, right? And it just, it's just a great thing. So I'll stop babbling. Let's all stand for worship. Amen. <laughs> Amen. You know, when, when the, the saints...